I'm John Carter in Moscow. Now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I'm John Carter in Petra, reporting from India. In Colombia. I'm John Carter. Today, John Carter talks to a world-famous astrophysicist about scientific reasons to believe in God. It's not just about faith. It's about newly discovered scientific evidence. His name is Dr. Hugh Ross. Hello, friend. I'm John Carter. Welcome today to The Carter Report. We have a very special guest with us today, Dr. Hugh Ross. Uh, Dr. Ross, it's an honor to have you with us today, sir. Well, thank you. And Dr. Ross comes from Reasons to Believe. Today, we're going to talk about the mysteries of the universe and lots more. Welcome today to The Carter Report. Time. It takes only a minute to have eternal life. How can you get saved in a minute? It's simple. First, believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Second, accept his free gift of eternal life. And then, you're saved. It's not hard. It doesn't take any time. You can be saved in a minute right now. Pray with me. Lord God, I realize that I am a sinner. My sin has separated me from you. I accept that your Son, Jesus Christ, died for me. I ask Jesus into my heart. If you prayed this prayer, you are saved. The next thing to do is tell someone, fellowship with other followers of Jesus, get baptized, read your Bible and pray. Choices, we make them every day, all day. The most important choice you will make in your life is whether to choose eternal life or let it pass you by. If you'd like more information about your new life, call the number and visit our website. The Pew Research Center put out a, a report recently. Uh, it's quite amazing and it's really quite alarming. They report that millions of young people are leaving the Christian church. Millions are leaving. And uh, these are some of the reasons that they're giving why they're leaving the Christian church. 51% question a lot of religious teachings. 34% say they don't like religious organizations. And 31% uh, say they don't like religious leaders. <laughs> it's not, not too good, is it? Um, this is similar to a 2016 Pew uh, report. And uh, they came up, the young people, when they interviewed them, came up with these, these statements. They no longer belonged to a religious group because they no longer believed it was true. They thought the church was teaching hocus pocus. They said a lot of them had gone to uh, university, college, and they had discovered evolution. And therefore, they decided they'd give up the Christian faith. I say it to you again, my friend, you may not know it, but it is true. Millions of young people are leaving the Christian church. And it's all over science. And sadly, most people just shrug their shoulders and they say, so what and, and who cares? I'm glad to tell you some people care. Dr. Ross at Reasons to Believe cares deeply. And Dr. Ross, we are honored to have you, sir, with us today. Well, yeah. thank you. You have a great organization. Why is it called Reasons to Believe? Well, we're a group of research scientists that are researching the frontiers of scientific research to demonstrate that the more we learn about uh, nature, the more reasons we have to believe in the supernatural handiwork of God. So we show people a track record that every day there's new reasons to believe in Jesus as creator, Lord, and Savior. Now, you're an astrophysicist. Yes. And uh, you're an astronomer. Yes. Um, how did you become an astronomer? So you, you are, what I'm trying to say, so the audience will hear this, you're a genuine scientist. Yes. Uh, how did you become a scientist? Well, I started when I was seven. I wanted to know why the stars were hot. Yeah. Uh, my parents encouraged me to go to the library. I did and came home with five books on astronomy and physics. When, how old? I was seven. Yeah. And I was doing that every you weekend. You must have been a different kid. 
<laughs> well, I grew up in an interesting neighborhood where a lot of us had already picked out our future careers at that, at that early age. Amazing. Uh, your parents were Christians? No, they were not. Uh, but they encouraged me in my studies of science. Uh, they encouraged me to look more broadly than just astronomy and physics. Uh, but it was my astronomy and physics that eventually persuaded me that the universe had a beginning. And if there's a beginning, I knew there had to be a beginner. In so, as a scientist, you believe there is, uh, how can I put this? You believe there are good reasons to trust in a creator God. Very good reasons, particularly for astronomy. Scientific reasons? Yes. I mean, the power of astronomy is, although we have no access to the present, we have direct access to the past. So, for example, when we look at the Crab Nebula, we don't see it as it is now. We see it as it was 6,500 years ago, because that's how long it took the light to reach our telescope. But we can actually see so far away, we can directly watch the universe being created. And it's our ability to directly witness a cosmic creation event that gives us the most rigorous, compelling scientific evidences. There must be a God that started it all. And so for the audience that is watching today, and hopefully there'll be a lot of young people, as a scientist, as an astrophysicist, um, you've studied the stars, the universe, and I've read some of your books. Um, I didn't find all of them too easy to read. <laughs> some are easier to read than others. <laughs> well, I've probably read the easiest ones. But no, I've read you, Improbable Earth and uh, mm -hmm. The Creator and the Cosmos, and I'm a fan of your books. So you believe that there are clear, rational reasons why a thinking person can believe in the existence of God? I do, and I believe that every week that goes by, we have even more reasons. The evidence gets stronger and stronger as we learn more and more about nature. Well, that, that's a big mouthful. You actually believe that as time goes by, there's more and more evidence right. to believe in God because the agnostic and the atheist says that all this religious stuff is, uh, is bunkum. You well, know, it's just all faith and there's no reason to believe at all. Once I did a radio debate with the British uh, physicist Paul Davies and uh, he He's was- He's a famous guy. He is. Yeah. He was very receptive to what I was saying, but he says, you know, I can't handle the baggage of the church. In other words, it wasn't belief Oops. in God that yeah. bothered him. Yeah. It was, you know, all the fixings of the church that concerned yeah. him. I says, well, you know, you can actually believe in God and uh, read the Bible and trust the Bible and trust in Jesus Christ without all that baggage. You know, you know what Nietzsche said uh, on one occasion. This famous man said that the greatest argument against Christianity, <laughs> this is a terrible thing to say, he said, were the members of the church. That's well, what Nietzsche said. He's right about that. But he's also missing something else. One of the greatest reasons to believe in the Christian faith is because of the members of the church. I mean, what I find fascinating about humans, uh, we are wicked beyond what any science could possibly explain. But we're virtuous beyond what any science can possibly explain. There's the two extremes in humanity. A wickedness that has no explanation naturalistically and virtue that has no explanation naturalistically. I just wish Nietzsche would actually look not just at the wickedness, but yes. at the virtue. And this man who gave up on God had a very unpleasant end, didn't he? He did. Yeah, and yeah. his life was filled with torments. Um, today we're going to try to do something quite extraordinary. Well, I say we're going to try to, but I think you're going to be the person who's going to do it. I'm suggesting we discover top 10 reasons to believe in God. All right. The top now, we, maybe we'll go beyond that, but I think if we can, if today we can concentrate and think of top 10 scientific reasons why a person who, like some of these young people, giving up on God, why they can believe in God and still be honest with themselves. I think Richard Dawkins said, talking to one young person, this young person said, I love my faith, but I can't believe. I know that my faith is wrong, and therefore I'm just going to keep believing blindly. And Dawkins said, and rightly so, he said, that's a tragedy. It is. When you've got to give up your intellect to believe in God. 
But as a, a famous scientist, do you believe that there's plenty of evidence why thinking people can believe in God and even believe in Jesus? Um, you haven't always believed. Uh, your, your parents were not believers. You certainly believe in science. Um, where were you educated, Hugh? I was educated in Canada. I mean, I was born in Canada and I got all my degrees in Canada. And yes. then I went to Caltech to do postdoctoral research. Tell me about your, your doctorate in, in astronomy. Why did you decide that you wanted to be an, an astronomer and not a biochemist or some, something else? Well, I knew from the age of eight onward that my future career would be in astronomy and physics. They're the seven books you took home. <laughs> <laughs> they were. I mean, I was just so fascinated about the fact that in astronomy, you're really asking the big questions. Why is the universe the way it is? Yes. And I wanted to actually explore those deep questions. And so I thought, well, you know, the best way to do that is actually look at the galaxies and quasars that are the farthest away actually explore what's going on near the creation event. Now, in some surveys, Caltech's come, uh, Caltech has come in as easily one of the best universities in the world. Oh, especially for astronomy and physics. Yeah, I think it, uh, with MIT, it came in on a survey I saw about the same. On other surveys, it's come in as number one. Yeah, it's number one for physics and astronomy. That's why I chose to go there. <laughs> uh, also, I wanted uh, to use their telescopes. At the time, they had the only telescope array, radio telescope array, in a high-altitude desert. So I says, I want to go there. I also appreciate the egalitarian spirit of Caltech, how everyone's kind of on the same level, professors, grad students, postdocs, undergrads. There's a high respect. It's not hierarchical like the uh, European universities. Well, the church. Or the church, for that matter. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I think the, the comment about young people. And so there's a desire to discover truth. There is. And frankly, I'm optimistic about the younger generation because mm -hmm. they really want to dive in. They want to debate. They want to dialogue. I found that the reason why they're turned off by the church, they don't have the chance to ask questions. They don't have the chance now, to the engage. The church, the church is, is not answering many of the questions they have or is not even willing to entertain the questions. Uh, absolutely, so. and uh, I think that the church is often so close-minded that it's pushing people with minds out. Well, I am encouraged that the younger generation are wanting to go to Starbucks and talk theology. I mean, uh, they, they love the opportunity to engage. They especially like the opportunity to engage with older people like us that have done a lot of study. Well, they like engaging with you. Well, I think they love engaging with you, too. I find that, you know, they really respect people that have uh, had a lot of experience and a lot of education. And, uh, you know, it's amazing to me how these young people want to hang around. Well, we respect you here uh, tremendously. We, we respect what you believe. We respect your mind and uh, your ethics. Now, I know enough about uh, astronomy after reading your books to be just slightly dangerous. So I just want you to be a little kind to me today. If, sure. I, if I say some really dumb things, that you'll just sort of cover, <laughs> cover it up for me. The anthropic principle. Now, I want you folks to listen to this. Put your thinking caps on. The anthropic principle. Got it? What's the anthropic principle? Well, it's basically the evidence for fine-tuning design that we see in the universe that makes life possible and human beings possible. Why is it called anthropic? Well, anthropos is the Greek word yes. for man. Yeah. So it's the idea that the universe has been designed to provide a home for humanity. But I'd argue it's much more than that. It's actually designed to make possible the redemption of billions of human beings. <laughs> this is a... this. Uh, your last point there is, uh, I've read some of your books on this, this is quite a, an amazing concept, but tell me now, and I, I want everybody out there to listen to this, because you're probably not going to hear this anywhere else, the fine tuning of the universe, anthropic principle. The universe is designed for the human race. Tell me about the fine tuning. Give me some examples, please. Well... For example, all the laws of physics are fine-tuned to make possible the existence of physical life. 
I mean, for example, if you were to alter the force of gravity relative to the force of electromagnetism by as little as one part in 10,000 trillion, 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 you're not going to have stable stars. I got, stable a stars sort of slipped, I got a feeling that sort of slipped through my mind a little uh, abruptly. Uh, say that again. The laws of physics, the laws of physics. are exquisitely fine-tuned. All make, of them? All of them are, yeah. And the gross features of the universe, the age of the universe, the size of the universe, the mass of yeah, the universe. Tell me this thing you told me about, what was it? You said it was fine-tuned and you gave an illustration. Yeah, that the, there are four forces of physics. Yeah. And the force of gravity is much weaker than the force of electromagnetism. It must be much weaker in order for stable stars to exist in the universe. In fact, you have to fine tune the ratio of the gravitational force to the electromagnetic force to better than one part in 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion. Otherwise, stars will instantly explode or they'll never form in the first place, and the stars you need to make physical life possible will never exist in the universe. On one other occasion in Arcadia, I had the privilege of interviewing you, and uh, you held up a dime. I'm sure you don't remember this. Sure, I remember that. Yeah, ah, you got a great memory. And you said, if well, if the mass of the universe were out by the weight of a dime, relative to the rate and weight of the rest of the universe. Yes. So tell me that again, because I said to you, who else believes this? Does anybody else believe? Who else believes this? And you basically said every educator person. <laughs> well, it's been slightly refined. I mean, that statement I made in Arcadia was presuming that we didn't have dark energy. Oh. We now know that the universe is dominated by dark energy. Yeah, what's the proportion, dark energy? 71% of all the stuff of the universe is dark energy. That doesn't include dark matter? Well, the dark matter is 23%. Okay. Then the ordinary matter is about 4.5%. So it's over 90%, which is dark matter and dark energy. Uh, if you add up the dark stuff, uh, all, all the dark matter and the dark energy, it adds up to 99.73% of all the stuff of the universe. And so when we look at the universe, at the stars and everything, we're seeing... Uh, a quarter of a percent. A quarter of 1%. And, and that's, not because, that's not because uh, the telescope's not big enough. Oh, no, we can see plenty far enough away, but the but reason... But the stuff, we can't see it. Well, you have to fine-tune that quantity of dark stuff mm. to better than one part in 10 to the 122nd power, or you will not get physical life in the universe. And that's fine-tuning far greater than that dime illustration, way so, greater. So I, I won't be using the dime anymore. Well, it's still I, a good illustration, I, I've but got, the fine-tuning is even I've more impressive. I've got pictures, and I've got graphs on the dime. I was so impressed. I, I talked about this in Russia and wherever I went. I don't know how many people understood it, but it, I, I was certainly impressed. So now the fine tuning is tied in with gravity and dark energy. Every feature that we can measure of the universe yes. and every feature of the laws of physics shows us incredible high degree of fine tuning design to make life possible. The other thing we notice is the fine tuning goes up when you start about, okay, what do we need to get a bacterium? What do we need to get bacteria that last long enough yeah. to make plants and animals possible? Mm -hmm. If you talk about animals, the fine tuning goes up orders of magnitude more. And then for humans, it exponentially increases the fine tuning you need to get human beings. But the greatest increase of all is if you want a universe with humans, where humans can retain their free will and be permanently delivered from sin and evil. That's the greatest fine-tuning of all. And what impresses me about the study of the universe and the earth, everything in the universe has been designed to make possible the redemption of human beings. Um, these are amazing concepts because when I read the Pew Research report, the young people who are leaving the church by droves say, because they haven't been taught these things and the church hasn't been teaching these things, um, they say there's no evidence. Well, obviously, they, they just don't know, do they? No one's presented the evidence for them. Now, 
When I speak on university campuses, I discover these young people are really eager to hear about the evidence. Great audience. Yeah. How many university campuses have you been to? Uh, about 350. That's basically here in the USA? No, that's including those around the world. Uh -huh. And you've been to Loma Linda yeah, I and have. other places. Then you told me you went to a, a great college down in the Caribbean. It was the University of the Southern Caribbean. So I've been to all three USC's, University of Southern California, University of South Carolina, and the University of the Southern Caribbean. And so on these campuses, you find young people who are are searching for, um, for answers, looking for ultimate reality. Is this true? I find that young people are more spiritually searching than the older generations. And their minds are not so closed. Well, they're eager to dialogue. They do not want to hear sermons. No. They, 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 don't want to, they want to be able to engage you. And so what we do is we go on these university campuses with a relatively short message, then a long time of Q&A, and then we follow that with informal one-on-one -on -one dialogue. So they don't want someone pontificating to them. <laughs> they don't. They, they want to engage you. They want to, you know, take you down the path they want to go. And I find they don't hang, they'll hang around till midnight talking to you. That's how hungry they are and, to find and they, out about this And they are stuff. receptive. Very receptive. And they don't have closed minds. They don't have closed minds. And I think the church just needs to realize this is a different generation. Mm -hmm. They want dialogue. They want engagement. And they want us to deal with the really hard questions. And so Jesus, I think, would have got on very well with them. Oh, sure. In fact, one thing I often do in university campuses is we're going to go into Q&A, but we got a rule, no softball questions. We only want hardball questions. And that's what the young people want to do. They want to be able to engage you with the really challenging questions. Now, this is not going to be easy uh, because I probably won't be the uh, best interviewer that's ever lived on the face of the earth. We're going to try to get, uh, well, you're going to get them, top 10 reasons. I can do that for you. Okay, now you've given us one on, what are we going to call the first one? Well, I'd say you want to start off with the origin of the universe, that when we look at the universe, all the observational evidence tells us. So we're going us, to put this up, okay, we're going to put this up, number one, top 10. We've already given lots of stuff, but we're going to sort of get, I'm going to get a little more organized now. And the first top 10 reason is going to be the origin of the universe. Right. Why does the origin of the universe suggest that there is a creator God, such as described in the Bible? Well, we now have a huge amount of observational evidence about the history of the universe. A hundred percent of that observational evidence screams at us that the universe has a beginning. And, and this is beyond controversy now. It's beyond controversy. And we're not just talking the beginning of matter and energy. We're talking the beginning of space and time itself. Uh -huh. Based on these observations, theoretical astrophysicists have developed over 30 space-time theorems, which basically prove that the universe not only has a beginning, but that's when space and time were created. Mm. which implies there must be an agent beyond space and time yes. that created our universe of uh -huh. matter, energy, space, and time. And what I find interesting about that, the Eastern religions claim that God creates within space and time that eternally exists. And it goes around in circles, doesn't it? Well, some of them are circular. I uh -huh. mean, there's a variety of models within the Eastern religions, but what they all have in common is that God or gods create within space and time. The mm -hmm. God of the Bible is different. He creates independent of space and time. So he makes space and time. He creates space and time when he creates the universe. And now we can prove that with the rigor of observations and theorems. So this is not, this is not just talk. It's not just talk. No, this is, uh, I, I say to some of my, my Christian friends, don't be afraid when we talk about these things. Uh, Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So listen to the truth. Many Christians, including members of my own church, are terrified by the term, the Big Bang. They shouldn't be. They uh, think it's evolution. Well, the Big Bang is the most highly fine-tuned thing we can observe in all of science. And it's got nothing to do with evolution. In fact, it's, a, it's the opposite. I the mean, opposite of evolution. Well, for example, in the early part of the 20th century, there was a debate in the astronomical community 
Is the universe quadrillions of years old with enough time for biological evolution? Quadrillions of years old. Quadrillions, or is it only billions? Uh -huh. And now we have the evidence that the universe is young. Now, it's only billions of years. It's very, very old, isn't it? Well, that's uh, <laughs> that's a you know a billion a uh, million trillion years. So, and, and that's about years. the time that uh, they think would be needed for the evolutionary process to work. Well, that's what the astronomers were saying in the early 1920s. If we want to save the biological evolutionary model, we mm. need a minimum of a thousand trillion years or a quadrillion uh, 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 years. Uh, so how, how old? A thousand trillion years. At least a thousand trillion. I would argue today we need a lot more time than that. But back then, that's what they were saying. That's for Darwinism to work. That's for Darwinism or the modern, uh, you know, yeah. evolutionary yes. models. Yes. Um, but astronomers said, no, there isn't enough time. It's mm. only 14 billion years. Now, Dr. Ross, uh, I know the Bible a little bit, and uh, you know it uh, very well, I'm sure. The Bible doesn't set out to tell us when the universe was created. It doesn't, but you know what shocked me when I first mm -hmm. picked up a Bible at age 17? Mm -hmm. Is that all the fundamental uh, principles of Big Bang cosmology were stated in the Bible. I'm sure. Thousands of years. I'm sure. Like the expansion of the universe. Yes. That's in you know, six different Bible I've, authors I've talking about I've read on this that. stuff. Yeah. Now, uh, tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong, but I understand from uh, astronomy, looking through the telescopes, and all other sorts of things, it can be defined quite precisely. Now, we're not talking about this world, we're not talking about human beings, but the cosmos, uh, space and time, came into being about 13.8 billion years ago. Right. 13.79, yeah. they got it to four places now. They've changed it a little bit. Just was, a tiny bit. It was 13.82, wasn't it? Well, no? there, one measurement says 13.81, another measurement says 13.877, you average the two, it's 13.79. Okay, I'll try to remember that, so that if you're ever in my audience, I won't you know, make a faux pas. So the point of the matter is though, and I want everybody to hear this, and we're going to talk about this more in the next uh, interview, that the Bible teaches the beginning of all things. And astronomy proves that the Bible was right. Correct. The Bible stated that uh, God created space and time when he created the universe. We can now prove that with the rigor of astrophysics. The Bible thousands of years ago said the universe is expanding. Astronomers had no idea of that until the 1920s. And now we got evidence that the Bible got that part right. The Bible also said the laws of physics don't change. We can measure the laws of physics all the way back to the cosmic creation event. We see no change in the laws of physics, exactly what the Bible said thousands of years ago. I'm talking to Dr. Hugh Ross, who is a famous astrophysicist. And we'll be back after this break. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.